thank you, Martin, and thank you, Dan, and the uh, FAO and Commission for inviting me. Um, this is a uh, subject very uh, near to my heart. I've been in the uh, biopesticide area for many, many years, and exciting to see all the activity. So I'm going to try to give an overview of uh, U.S. oversight of these, uh, share between different agencies, and uh, try to, to share the landscape and some of what we're doing. So um, EPA regulates biopesticides. I'm going to talk, first talk about biopesticides. EPA regulates biopesticides in the United States, and uh, in 1994, um, there was a division created specifically to focus on biopesticides. Uh, we had for some time specific data requirements for them since the 1980s, and so um, the, the reason that the division was formed was to kind of accelerate the review and to prioritize the, the review process for these types of products, recognizing um, their benefit in reducing pesticide risk. Um, biopesticides, as far as we define them, include naturally occurring chemical substances that control pests, and we call them biochemical pesticides, uh, and then microorganisms that control pests, we call those microbial pesticides, and then uh, I'll go into detail with emerging technology pesticides, which include some products of biotechnology. Uh, typically, biopesticides have unique modes of action and are considered reduced risk pesticides. And again, that's why we formed this specific division to uh, facilitate their review. Um, so biochemical pesticides, as far as, again, how we define it, are naturally occurring substances or structurally similar synthetic substances to those natural substances. Uh, that have a non-toxic mode of action, and that's key. So a biochemical, not every biochemical that's a pesticide is a biochemical pesticide in our definition. It has to have a non-toxic mode of action. Um, history of safe exposure to humans in the environment. These include things like pheromones, plant regulators, attractants, antifeedants, desiccants, and other substances. And again, uh, with the pheromones, I think it was in the 90s, we had this uh, significant regulatory reform reducing um, the requirements for pheromones, and we saw a large uh, increase in those in the United States. Uh, microbial pesticides are microorganisms used as pesticides, and they're subject to our pesticide law, FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. So these microbial pesticides include eukaryotic microorganisms, that's protozoa, algae, and fungi, prokaryotic microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, and it also includes genetically modified microorganisms. We have uh, a couple of extra requirements for those. Now, unmodified macroorganisms, such as nematodes, parasitic wasps we've talked about, EPA does not regulate those if they're not modified. Um, and they're exempt from our pesticide law, um, but they're not exempt from our uh, pesticide residue law, which is the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So uh, interesting example is that in the U.S. they use parasitic wasps in grain silos to control, I think, tribolium and some other things. Um, so those pest parts of the parasitic wasp in the grain actually have a pesticide tolerance exemption. Uh, just a nuance there. Um, on the emerging technology side, so we've got uh, our plant incorporated protectants. These are like the uh, transgenic crops. EPA regulates the pesticide trait in those crops and their residues. So an example of that is the BT corn. Um, we regulate the cry protein and the, uh, the gene that's in the corn uh, that produces that. Uh, we also uh, look at genetically, this is my branch now that I'm uh, primarily what I'm focusing on. Uh, genetically engineered microorgan microbial pesticides, so there's a number of those. Um, one in development right now, for instance, uh, is uh, being, we've had some experimental use against the citrus greening um, using a uh, spinach peptide uh, to try to control the, the citrus greening uh, bacteria. Uh, Microbial pesticides in introduced into mosquitoes, so that would be the Wolbachia. So we re our regulatory hook is the Wolbachia bacteria 
but we're actually regulating the use of these mosquitoes for reducing mosquito populations. Uh, excited, this year we uh, uh, registered the first one to be used in Aedes aegypti uh, throughout the United States. Uh, genetic modifications in pest animals intended for use as a pesticide, so this is the uh, genetically engineered uh, invertebrates and, and also would be rodents and things of that nature as they come to development. Um, but the one we've had before us is the Oxytec mosquito that was approved for testing in Florida, again to reduce mosquito populations. Uh, some of the DSRNA or exogenous RNA sprayable products, we were glad to see a one that was approved this year for use in Colorado potato beetle. A lot of potential there with these products. And then of course peptides and proteins. We have a number of those, uh, including some of the harp and spider toxins. So what are the benefits of biopesticides? Um, they're less toxic than conventional pesticides. This is why we prioritize them. And of course, uh, it, well, in addition to our division being formed, there was an executive order recently by the current administration on biotechnology and the bioeconomy, and the priority of biopesticides was noted in that executive order as far as uh, follow up on that. Um, generally affect only the target pest and close to related organisms, often effective in small quantities that decompose quickly and useful in IPM programs. Again, a lot of benefits. Um, pesticide specific benefits uh, for these products in the United States, there's short restricted entry intervals. So we have often uh, re-entry intervals that you cannot enter the field after so many hours and so these products usually have shorter typically four hours versus 12 or longer. Uh, tolerance exemptions are typical rather than having numerical tolerances, specific residue levels is an unlimited number uh, amount of residue that can be there because they're the safety of the products. Um, there's low or no pre-harvest intervals as we're aware typically with pesti many pesticides you have to wait so long before you can harvest after application for these products uh, there's often no pre-harvest intervals. And uh, I think as was uh, helpfully pointed out earlier about the, um, the toolbox is getting smaller for conventional pesticides and these provide more pest control tools. So for the remainder of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on the following subset of biocontrol or agents. Uh, microorganisms used to control pests, arthropods used to control pests, genetically modified microorganisms to control pests and genetically modified arthropods used to control pests. And as far as some of the biotechnology uh, oversight, uh, there's a link here and I'm working to get this cleared so Dan can release it to everybody. Um, but this uh, takes you to that site that kind of outlines the USDA, FDA, and EPA oversight of these products in more detail. As I mentioned, in the United States, there's really three agencies that primarily regulate biocontrol products. Um, EPA regulates as pesticides, uh, and also under our Toxic Substances Control Act, some of the biostimulants, uh, some of those microorganisms that are intergeneric as we define. So it wouldn't include the naturally occurring, uh, except um, as an exception for Berkeley but largely the, just the genetically modified ones. USDA regulates under their Plant Protection Act and their Animal Health Protection Act, uh, typically under phytosanitary for the Plant Protection Act. Um, and FDA regulates under new animal drugs. And I'll, I'll point out that nuance later, particularly with mosquitoes. Um, well, let me just say now. So EPA regulates pesticide use for uh, genetically modified um, macroorganisms. Uh, FDA regulates it as an animal drug. So for instance, right now, um, Wabaki and there's also Turk was talk with some genetically engineered microbes. They can be used for population control. That's where EPA is involved for, as a pesticide. Or it can be used to limit the transmission of different diseases. So if you're, if you're modifying the mosquito to limit its ability to transmit a disease, then the Food and Drug Administration is involved because that's a, that's a drug to disease control claim. Um, got these next two slides from my colleagues at USDA and the Plant uh, Protection and Quarantine Group. So um, if you have a microorganism or an invertebrate, there's requirements for uh, a permitting for importation, interstate movement, and continued curation. 
for this, for these naturally occurring microbes and insects, USDA in the United States doesn't regulate if EPA has registered the pro a biopesticide product or the organism is under an EPA experimental use permit or EPA has exempted it specifically. So these are, and here at the bottom of the slide, uh, Derek is my colleague at USDA. He's a great contact for uh, USDA's uh, regulation of these uh, microorganisms and primarily invertebrates um, that are being going to be used in the United States. I want to point out the APHIS database they've recently published here on the web. Um, this is a database for use for importation and interstate movement of microbes and arthropods. So you can see if there's no jurisdiction or a permit is required. Um, on the other part of APHIS, uh, Biotechnology Group, they also regulate importation, interstate movement, and environmental release of modified microorganisms that may pose a plant risk. Um, and the same is true uh, with arthropods. So there's the. So EPA regulates, again, microorganisms to control pests, genetically modified microorganisms to control pests. Genetic modifications in animals intended for a pesticide, for uses of pesticide like the GE mosquitoes for population control, and residues of unmodified pest arthro control arthropods and foods. We do not regulate the unmodified arthropods um, used as pest control products. So those products are being sold. We don't regulate those. Um, just briefly, uh, we operate uh, for the pesticides on the, the FIFRA, the pesticide. A licensing Act in the United States and the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which deals with pesticide residues in food. Um, and it's just talking about the different pieces of FIFRA and FFDCA, uh, how we regulate those uh, products. Again, microorganisms are, are uh, microbial pesticides are intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating pests. Of course, uh, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, Bacillus subtilis. We're seeing a lot of uh, use as seed treatments in the United States, a lot of growth. We're also seeing what's kind of an uh, interesting development is a lot of the major companies are getting involved with biopesticides in the United States. Uh, companies such as Bayer, um, Corteva, uh, BASF. So there's a lot of interest by these larger companies, a lot of the developing uh, smaller companies interested too, a lot of growth from them. So across the board, uh, just some exciting work uh, happening as far as the development. Um, microbial pesticides have speci some specific risk issues. Um, they're often host specific. Uh, we look at infectivity, pathogenicity, and toxicity. Um, we look at transmissibility factors and competition. This is just kind of a brief overview to get a flavor. <laughs> um, Again, I mentioned we have data requirements that are in our regulations for microbial pesticides. These are reduced compared to chemical pesticides and specific for microbial pesticides. So uh, we have a tiered testing scheme and don't typically require subchronic or chronic studies. Um, and really, uh, we require some uh, toxicity pathogenicity studies. And I think um, that was pointed out earlier if there's knowledge about the microorganism, that can be used to justify not doing some of the studies by producing, you know, submitting, you know, hey, we have a lot of clinical experience with this, or we, we know this or organism and there's no, there's no human health concerns that can be used in, in a rationale to justify not doing the data. Lesser known microorganisms, we require these uh, toxicity pathogenicity studies. Um, for efficacy, just want to mention that briefly here. We don't require efficacy study. We, we require companies to do it, but not to submit it, except if it's a public health pest. So in the United States, if it's, if it's a public health pest, such as a mosquito, a tick, uh, you have to submit efficacy data. Uh, if it's just an agricultural uh, pest, you do not. Um, another thing to mention is that uh, for the microbial pesticides, we have a requirement for if you're doing small scale testing, and it's been genetically modified. You have to notify us typically in the United States for experimental uh, testing of pesticides in a field. If it's 10 acres or less, you don't need to get authorization from the federal government. 
but if it's genetically modified, you have to tell us a little bit about it, and then we let you know whether you have to do that or not. It's called a biotech notification. Um, lastly, I just want to share a little bit about the, the mosquitoes. Um, so these are uh, intended to reduce population. We have two right now uh, that we um, have in the uh, register. Well, we have one that's registered in the United States and one we've had under experimental use. Um, they introduce male mosquitoes into wild populations to mate with females that are already present in the area. And uh, the recurrent releases of these modified male mosquitoes results in less offspring and consequently uh, population decline. So you're not having to, to do as much spraying. Um, and uh, the, again, it's a, it's a sterile insect uh, technique that's being used to reduce mosquito populations. So we've evaluated, again, uh, two types. Um, one is the bacteria infected, I mentioned the Wabakia, and then also the genetic modifications um, with like the Oxitec uh, mosquito. And uh, we also had one very uh, rewarding uh, application recently in the U.S. state of Hawaii. Um, because of climate change, the temperature is rising. And so in the, um, there are endangered birds that have been at certain elevations that have been protected from avian malaria. And as climate change has happened and the, elevate, uh, the temperature has increased, these, uh, these Culex malaria, avian malaria carrying mosquitoes have been able to get to these higher, higher levels. And so basically these uh, beautiful Hawaiian songbirds are being wiped out, endangered species. So what, what we have, one of the programs we have in, in EPA is called the Section 18 program, which allows for an emergency exemption. And so um, there's a, the state of Hawaii requested um, the use of these Wabakia mosquitoes to protect these endangered birds. And so they've gone ahead and um, they go to these remote mountain areas and release these uh, Wabakia infected mosquitoes. Um, at these high elevations, and the hope is that they will protect some of these birds from going extinct. So that's, that's one of the uh, pretty exciting use of a biopesticide to prevent uh, the uh, extinction of an endangered uh, songbird in Hawaii. Uh, so I just, that's, that's the end of my presentation. Just want to say thank you and uh, appreciate all the work that you're doing in this biopesticide area. It's important and it really can bring about meaningful change for the environment. Thank you.